I V M. Hi, I'm Zarina Poonawala, your peak performance coach, life coach, emotional intelligence practitioner, and NLP practitioner. I'm also the founder of Abso Expertise Unique, and my organization constantly aims at building leaders across continents. After having worked with so many dynamic business honchos, entrepreneurs, startups, CEOs, management gurus, parents, and student communities worldwide, I am convinced that every individual has unleashed potential, and all we really need to do is realize it. Watch the magic unfold, enhance quality of life, relationships, and professions. On my show, be ready for some riveting conversations with inspirational people, snippets. Stories and much more. So here I am on this exceptional journey to find empowerment and inspiration anywhere I can. Come join me on this breathtaking path of self-realization, potential maximization, positivity, and most of all, embrace your inner power. You are on your way to empowering yourselves. Welcome to the Empowering Series with Zarina Punawala. On today's episode, I'm in conversation with a visionary who is inspiring and stimulating growth in startups, mid-sized companies, and large-scale organizations. With over 25 years of experience, he has built high-performance teams, strong businesses, and relationships across multicultural environments. Please welcome Vibhuti Channa, Director of Viridian Accelerator Center. Hi, Vibhuti. Hi, Zarina. How are you today? Very well, thank you, Zarina. How are you doing? I am good, thank you. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Vibhuti. You have such a exciting journey, and um, I can't wait to kind of deep dive into your journey, find out more about uh, you know how you've started off and uh, what's gotten you to actually help so many different businesses push themselves in the nascent stages and kind of move on into uh, becoming bigger, bigger fish in the sea. Thank you so much, and likewise, um, I think in some ways, Zarina, both you and I are trying to do the same thing: try and help people and motivate them to move to the next level. So we're probably on the same boat. Yes, more or less, I'm guessing. Vibhuti, let's start with uh, just figuring out how the past few months have been for you. How have they been treating you, considering the lockdown and you know a couple of open days, a couple of closed days, and of course the pandemic. So how have you been? Well, um, not too bad now, Zarina. Quite frankly, I, I must confess that we all came back home very happily on a weekend, looking forward to the Saturday, Sunday, not realizing that from Monday onwards we're not going to get back <laughs> to work. So I think some way we did kind of see this coming, but I don't think the magnitude of it hit us in, in any manner. And it's probably been at both levels, personally and for work. If you've been so used to being leaving the house early morning getting back late evening and kind of being on the treadmill so to speak and suddenly you're made to quite literally sit in a corner and face the wall you feel like a small school child back you know when your mother punished you saying stand in the corner but i think we've kind of come to terms with that on a work front we'd kind of started already anticipating this and had conducted a few sessions on a trial basis just to make sure technology didn't let us down which has a way of letting us down so we actually transitioned quite easily to digital format for our program we quite coincidentally just started off our cohort in the month of march and um, i am a bit embarrassed to confess that we've actually been more efficient uh, working from home I'm guessing we need uh, more of that kind of embarrassment around us right now to keep us motivated. So <laughs> please feel free to share how that uh, experience has been. But before that, I'd love to know more about your story. You know, you've uh, got this really interesting profile, and you've embarked upon this journey with Viridian, and uh, you have been doing a lot of work over the past twenty-five years, right? So can you please tell us about how this whole journey started for you, and how did you? Get on with uh, Viridian Accelerator Center. Well, Viridian, uh, to be honest, you know, all of us talk about career planning and all of that, and I think somewhere things happen. There is a point up to which you can plan things, and after which you just kind of have to go with the flow. And I'm just being born right honest about it. Opportunities come up, 
you kind of see, you explore them, you go for them, and then life takes its turn. I suppose at a personal level, at some stage, I wanted to come back to Delhi for personal reasons, and, and that's how I moved back here, which in some ways also kind of got this opportunity for me going. And I must admit, it's been a really enjoyable journey. It's very different to what I did in the initial part of my career, which was like any traditional corporate kind of a setup. It took a little while of transitioning because the corporate world operates very differently. The outside world is very different. So you you need to kind of come to terms with that very quickly. And the earlier you do, the better it is. And, and in some ways, actually, I find I'm a lot happier. And it's been a very humbling experience, if I must admit. Very humbling. You tend to build up notions about things, about these glass bubbles that you operate within. And you think everything is all about that. But when you start interacting with the entrepreneurs, there's just so much that they're doing. They're just so much more exciting work that they're doing. I would meet people initially and you would think the conversation would go in a certain way, but just very, very informative. And uh, by virtue of the fact that we're sector agnostic, you know, you could be talking with somebody about literature in one moment. The next meeting could be about sanitation. It could be about AI. It could be about blockchain. I can't imagine of any other role that I've done, which has kind of stretched my cerebral thinking in all directions like this. It just makes it very, very exciting. And that's the excitement with which when you're working from home, it's embarrassing to actually be efficient, I'm guessing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that's really wonderful, uh, Vibhuti. The whole work from home bit that you mentioned, you know, I'd love to kind of know more about that, considering that a lot of people are struggling on that front and they're finding it quite an obstacle, quite a challenge to be able to pull it off efficiently. So how are you guys able to do that so beautifully? Zarina, let me be very honest. I mean, the first two days, frankly, even um, I kind of didn't give it the, the seriousness that it needs. Mm-hmm. I would just sit with my laptop and kind of just flop anywhere and, you know, get into calls and whatever. And um, I think that doesn't work. From the third day, I actually made myself a corner in the house where I was out of everybody's hair. And I made sure that everybody else was out of my hair too. So in a very flippant manner, my wife tells me, she says, look, I'm not your office boy who will bring in chai every 10 minutes for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, you make up your mind when you want your chai and you'll have it, but uh, stay out of my hair. And I think that was a brilliant thing because then the routine runs independent of each other. It's not that, oh, there's some lovely garam parathas going, why don't you come and join us for it? Mm. It doesn't work like that. So by nine, I was on my desk in the corner, doors closed. And then I only stirred out for lunch. If I was able to, which happens at work as well. I mean, there are times you can't sit at the designated time for lunch. You end up having a working lunch. And that's exactly what happened here. And yes, you get a bit of breather in the morning because you save on travel. And that's a huge, shall I say, physical exhaustion off the table, clearly. The other thing is that there's none of the usual faffing around which happens in office, you know. You typically take a walk and you have a chai with somebody or you, you know, a little ca- casual conversation somewhere else. None of that is happening. So even if I wanted to speak to my team, I had to structure calls with them. I just couldn't, you know, stroll across the corridor, so to speak, and have a conversation. And obviously, I was getting in their way as well. So I think it just brought in a lot of rigor, but that's all of it is self-imposed. You need to bring in structure yourself. Nobody else can do it for you. And I think that's what happened with the team as well. And we all kind of figured that we would sit on our tables at nine in the morning and we would go through. The other good thing which happened is that in a team, you know, which is naturally anywhere, is that you have people who are morning people and you have people who are not the morning people, you know. And so the not the morning people are always kind of straggling in in the morning. There's always some lame excuse of traffic or whatever, and you know it, it's none of that. Right. What this did was that it gave that flexibility to those people. They said, look, I can't make it in the morning. I'm happy to work through till two or three in the morning. And that was their decision because they found they were more efficient that way. 
so we came to a happy compromise and we said look we will not have 8 45 a.m conversations which is what you normally do in the office you know first thing get it out of the way we came to an understanding that look probably 10 10 30 is a good time because all the late night guys have had time to catch up on some reasonable rest and so we slot we kind of moved those meetings to a little later in the day and then everybody went off in their directions to do their work and come back and catch up the next day or you know whenever you needed to if you didn't need to catch up the next day you caught up after two three days and obviously you can always have one-on-one conversations with people whenever you need to so that's the good thing the flip of that is that i love having one-on-one conversations or meeting people you know the whole kind of thing which you have in relationships right um that's clearly not there and that was something i would struggle in my head how do we do that if it was somebody a new team member who were joining your team you know here we have the advantage that everybody knows everyone so you can very easily pick it up and move on but i find that we kind of slotting times once or twice a week where you kind of just have a casual conversation to keep that softness in the in the whole piece going so you know you need a bit of that as well that actually is true because i think a lot of people are missing the tangibility that comes with the job the human connections but i'm quite impressed with the way you've used the the timing aspect i think there's a book by mihali on flow and that explains this concept very beautifully also about you know people just having their natural flow at a certain time and being able to work that's the reason why you have the morning and the evening and the night people but you're kind of using that to your strengths as an organization and making sure that everybody is able to be as productive and efficient and most people may not give the flexibility to their employees in that sense vibhuti so what kind of advice would you give to those people i suppose it's also a bit industry driven um zarina mm-hmm. you know at times organizations tend to get bound by external environments in which they need to get their business or operate or whatever and that tends to determine in our case because we are entrepreneurial by nature in the sense of the people we work with and who are so to speak customers are and people who we support you know it gives us that little bit of flexibility having said that i mean obviously entrepreneurial doesn't mean uh, laissez faire and you just do what you want to you know there is a structure in that but if i might kind of delve back for instance when you, you know you're in adar beverage and you're having to deal with star hotels or properties or whatever i mean there's no point going there before 11 in the morning because you're not going to get anything done and you're kind of working till about two in the morning three in the morning because you know most parties or events or night functions are finishing at that time so those kind of organizations have have built it in to their system and i suppose a bit of that kind of naturally helped me structure it for the people here as well people in the finance world depending you know if they're dealing internationally because they have to make sure what's happening in london or what's happening in america they need to get their time zones reworked i think people do it that way as well so i guess we learn from each other some of them do it willingly some do it unwittingly that's absolutely true since we're talking about you know how it's different for you and different for your organization how does uh, viridian accelerator center actually work and uh, how do you sort of push those startups and companies to achieve their potential so you know we obviously have a structure and we need to equip and train and get our team to be up to speed to understand the whole business because you know being an entrepreneur in your own right uh, zeena i'm sure you'll realize that there are two bits to this whole journey uh, there is obviously intrinsically what your work is all about whatever you choose to be i mean in your instance if you choose to empower people in a certain fashion but that's what it is somebody may want to do food or whatever else and you kind of need to support them but there's a huge softer part which is the underlying to it which is you as an individual and i think that's hugely critical which also needs to be taken into cognizance because each of us behave differently each of us react differently and you need to kind of work with people to try and bring out their strengths we had somebody who was hugely lacking in self confidence for various reasons and we realized that 
there was no point us trying to get anything done with him on his business till he didn't sort himself out. So we sat among ourselves and we said, look, how do we help this individual? And we said, look, let's just spend the four months, which is the duration of the program, helping him get confidence in himself. Because the moment he does that, it will automatically address all the challenges he was facing in his business. Because his business was just not moving, no matter what support we gave him. It was really heartening. It was really wonderful to see him when he moved out of the program. The person could barely speak to you when you sat across the table. And this is one-on-one -on -one with nobody else. As part of the program, one of the things we do is we try and help people on how to make a pitch in front of an investor in a reasonably safe environment amongst us. But, you know, I'm sure you'd also understand that no matter how confident we may be talking one-on-one, -on -one, the moment you make anybody stand in front of 10 people, even in a reasonably safe environment, you start perspiring oh, of course. and get clammy hands. And this gentleman stood up and you wouldn't believe it, he won the pitching contest. That is wonderful. So it was a huge shift for him. And I think that's where the program works because it addresses areas which also need to be addressed and no structured program would ever do that. That's the flexibility we keep in our program to help people. And then obviously, if you have the confidence, then you will get your business going as well. That's not to say that, you know, we don't focus on the business. But that's also equally critical. But, you know, you need to take a call on uh, which hat fits home. So, Zarina, the program addresses an entrepreneur at two levels. One is an individual, as I just explained in the example right now. Or now we help them grow themselves as individuals, but equally help them in their business. That is fundamental and the very reason why they join the program. We work to help them deliver their business goals and equally make them investable. The investors should be willing to put the money behind their venture. So essentially make the business robust in every way. It's wonderful because something as simple as confidence and a word that is so often used and sometimes I think underrated, Vibhuti, can have such an impact in someone's life and being able to tap that and making sure that it's taken care of for somebody in that stage of their career is it's wonderful and he actually won that's what you said right <laughs> yes I, I was surprised and you know this was the judging uh Zarina was done with an independent panel and there were external entries also which came in so it was not just in-house people yeah it wasn't your internal affair to boost his confidence no <laughs> wow you know so it blew my brains at that time i was so delighted that day i was really delighted absolutely fantastic i love the fact vibhuti that uh, it is something as simple as confidence because, you know, a lot of people I personally, yeah, of course, to come across, but I'm sure that when you're running a business as yourself and you come across people, they're often all to do with the PPTs, the structure, you know, uh, having the organization put in a certain manner, their business model, but something like this may be missed so easily while you're looking after all the other aspects. And uh, being able to tap it in the right time, I think that's very, very intriguing. And maybe that's why it's companies which can build people and build leaders like you're doing currently, which is possibly allowing those companies to sustain, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's a holistic thing, Zarina. I mean, even if you look at people when you work in organizations, there are those you always wonder, oh, you know, he or she is always kind of having it easy. Or so-and-so is always struggling, you know, he's not being able to make a headway in a meeting or whatever. You know, he's not being able to get people aligned to himself or herself. And if you kind of sit back and away from it and kind of dissect it clinically, a lot of it, it is about the confidence with which you project what you want to do or what you need or how or where you need people's support. You know, you would only kind of back somebody who's sounding convincing to you in a transparent manner. You know, it's not about pulling wool over people's eyes, but in the legitimate way of sounding confident. So at times, yes, you're right. It's just the simplest thing about getting the person's confidence going. Just basics. Just fantastic. I'm completely blown away by the story myself because, you know, I'm talking from a very different perspective right now, Vibhuti, being able to see a company which is looking after so many different dynamics for uh, firms, for organizations. But Looking into this aspect, I think that itself is just, it's mind-blowing. I just loved 
this story it's amazing so i'm kind of speechless myself you know <laughs> in a moment but frankly amazing so obviously you have a host of entrepreneurs who the young the old you know combination and various age groups possibly you know in these really unexpected times everybody's shaken up a bit and trying to find ways of surviving right how are you giving them that feeling of assurance or what is it that you're telling them what is it that they need to do to keep up with the times zarina i think there are few things there mm-hmm. and i think the first and foremost for all of us is the quicker you accept what the reality is the quicker you start working to a solution or you know or working towards what is perhaps what we you know in today's parlance call the new way of doing things or however you may choose to classify that now it's all very well to say that but if i were to just take the example i spoke of myself i was lounging around and doing my work you know on the machine uh, for two days happily thinking that oh it's just a few days thing and you know we'll be back to work like a flick of a button the way it was switched off for us it will be switched on for us and had we gone on that way we probably would have just struggled that much longer so the point is that you need to accept what the reality is let's not fight it once you've done that then you automatically find what you should be doing and how you work your way around it and sometimes you know you need to take decisions which might be a bit hard but you need to do it with a heart so when it's coming to businesses one of the first things you do is you you check your cash flows and therefore try and address the easier ones if i might say first and why i say easier is because reducing office rent reducing all those kind of expenses doesn't touch your team that's the easier bit to do the second bit is to try and tell them that look the business can't afford it okay we are going to have to cut salaries because you know we don't have the money i think it's about being honest with your people as well and the same thing for the business we we would tell them is that look the truth is today even as we speak now so many months now so you know i don't think anybody anybody knows when this is going to end absolutely and therefore to hope that one fine day you know the prime minister will make another announcement say oh hunky dory and get back to work it's mm-hmm. not happening so work around ways on how you can adapt to it you've addressed your costs what you need to do with your business now and i think what covid has done has its forced technology on all of us much as you may love it or much as you may hate it whichever camp you may sit on i would have never imagined that i would sit in a corner and happily run an office without really not much any difference why were we wasting so much time traveling up and down to work every day so how much of fuel we would have saved and which is true for all businesses this technology see how you can adapt it but fundamentally i think what it's also done and what we have told advise people to your question is that please go back to basics the good old way the good old principles of doing business i think those become even more important today i was i was reading about amul uh, you know it's such a household name and i was astonished to find or rather read that they've actually had a growth in their overall dairy business and essentially not been driven from basic milk alone but also from butter and cheese and they've had no interruption anywhere in their business over these months if you try and kind of figure out what their business is it starts from the farmer in his little shed where the cattle is taking milk to a collection center and then you know it finding its way through the cold chain to your doorstep in body packs irrespective of what social strata you are in it comes in a body pack every morning it's perishable whether it's an infant who needs to drink milk for his or her nutrition or it's an adult who needs it for chai coffee the hygiene aspect cannot be eliminated on something which is a hugely perishable product and they've done it very successfully i think what it drives on the point is that this is going to force us to go back to our basics as long as the basics of your business are there as long as you're doing it the right way and honestly using technology and keeping a sharp eye on your costs you should be there 
the consumer is not going to pay for anything frivolous today. He's not. That's actually so true. I mean, you need to know and you need to go back to the basics because the foundation of your business eventually lies on the basics and what principles you're building it around. In fact, maybe this is also a good time to reconsider how you you visualize your business and maybe what needs to be changed in your business module. Would you reckon that? Yes, absolutely. Zarina, I mean, would any of us have ever thought that any of the star hotels are going to do takeaway food? You would have never dreamt of it. And I saw the, what Taj is doing. I mean, you know, they've picked up key restaurants or rather the signature restaurants across at least Bombay, Delhi. I'm sure they're doing it elsewhere as well. And, uh, you know, you can call them online and within a certain uh, distance radius, they will deliver it home. That's right. Not only Taj Vibhuti, I think all the top uh, restaurants, hotels within every city for that matter, which probably is in a better space and is in a workable condition, they've all started, they're all open to business and they've changed their strategies of how they're actually running the business. And you'd never, you're right, you'd you'd never imagine a home delivery from a five-star hotel. You would never imagine that. Absolutely. And and I think that's, again, a classic example of, you know, given how all large organizations are, and it takes a little while to get things moving there just because of the sheer size and momentum. But they've, again, accepted the reality. They know what the truth is out there. And they've said that, look, whether you want laundry services of a five-star quality or you want five-star quality food, here we are. I mean, essentially, they need to bring in the revenue and playing on their strengths. In fact, you know, I was just thinking that not only the food business, but if you consider the delivery businesses. So if you're looking at all, you know, the leading delivery apps and the companies, they started putting out groceries for you. They started being able to you know, deliver all the important essentials that you require during this time. So again, there was a shift in the way they were considering their business and still trying to figure things out. If you see any retail store these days, the first thing you will see is every company which makes clothes of any form is making masks, has already found a way of making masks, matching masks to the outfits. And because you're right, we don't know how long this is going on. So people have found a way to sell it. They found a way to make it work for them. And is that possible for most businesses though, Vibhuti? Because, you know, that's the question that I had. And I was inquisitive because sometimes I also face that challenge when a company is asking me currently, you know, uh, how do we deal with this and how do we go about it? You've come across so many different sectors and different industries. So which are the industries that you think are more sustainable at this point in time? Which are the ones who are going to find a challenge in the future? I think you're right, Serena. I mean, there will be some where we will have to think a bit harder. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, the Airbnbs of the world or, or, you know, of that kin or that tribe may have a longer haul. Because, look, fundamentally, even if the government opens up, people are not stepping out. You know, they've opened up malls in Delhi and wherever else, but there's nobody going there. But Um, There are others, I mean, you were talking about matching masks and it reminded me of this uh, thing which popped up on my machine the other day, uh, was Zodiac. Now, frankly, I haven't touched a shirt of mine in the past few months because I'm not stirring out anywhere, right? Uh, What happens to somebody like Zodiac who does uh, formal shirts? Um, And I thought it was quite intelligent what they did because they've come up with a fabric which, frankly, even when you iron it, it has a bit of a crushed look. And they've given it a slightly more casual cut. And I thought that was a brilliant idea because most of us who now don't have any support staff at home or access to any of the traditional forms of support you had, and if you have to iron your own shirt every day, here's a shirt which once it's out of the laundry and if it's just dried properly, you don't need to bother ironing it. What more can I ask for? Because that's the way they've treated the fabric. And uh, I'm sure in their industry, they have enough cuttings of fabric which go waste. They've just used that to give you a matching mask. So it's no incremental cost in terms of input that may have gone in, but they have kind of moved their business to kind of see what the new reality is. But, you know, it's not going to be easy. I mean, we've just spoken about hospitality, which has been hugely hit, and they've kind of managed to rework. 
You're right as far as consumer goods is concerned. I mean, over the three, four months period, the amount of, you know, the normal, what you call the non-healthy food we all tend to eat, potato crisps and stuff like that. I would see mountains of those lying at the neighborhood banya. Because in those days, when you had to stand within those yellow circles, you know, to wait your turn, he was your go-to person. And I don't think um, those guys would have seen the kind of uh, sales they they saw in those times, you know. So some have won, some have lost. Uh, but change, they all will have to. They all have to do. So in your opinion, one is change and one is going back to the basics, which is probably going to... Um, help a lot of companies sustain or get through this. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And I think they'll have to adopt technology very quickly. Like you were talking about the delivery guys, for instance. Right. You'll just have to adopt technology to kind of, you know, this whole touch-free deliveries and whatever else you call them. Yeah. Contactless delivery. That's what they're calling. Yes. 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 So there are a lot of new words, Vibhuti, that have come up and uh, possibly they're going to become part of the dictionary, I'm guessing, at some point in time. You know, the new normal and um, social distancing and, of course, contactless deliveries, uh, which I find very interesting because, you know, as not only the world, but as a country, I think we just know how to get on with things, which has its pros and its cons. So like you mentioned, a lot of people are not getting out. I have seen a couple of very different approaches. In fact, today I read in the papers that we are crossing 10 lakh positive cases as a country and uh, even then there are people who are quite negligent in their behavior in general right so i've realized that it's more about responsible citizenship at this point in time which is a word that should become the new normal using responsible citizenship is not coming up anywhere and hence i'm a little with a study that i actually did recently i figured out there's something like revenge buying which people might go back to once everything starts opening up for good as it has in a lot of countries, like, you know, in the UK, the mayor is uh, uh, promoting the boroughs market and he says everything's fine and, you know, please come visit. And he's personally promoting the boroughs market and UK's cases are rising, the death tolls are rising, but there is no shopping. Similarly, when things begin and start, I am afraid that there will be a certain sect that might go into the revenge buying mode and forget all about what happened in the last few months. Do you think that's a possibility? That's just my perspective. Yes, you're right, Zarina, when you say that, you know, there's a new set of jargons which has come around and, I, and I'm and i always trying to catch up with them. <laughs> I remember when I came into this industry, they would keep talking about pivot. And until then, the only pivot I knew was a movement of your foot when you were dancing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, social distancing and whatever else. I mean, more seriously, I think the bit about responsibility is worrisome, actually, Zarina. And, you know, when we saw the migrant movement, I think they didn't have a choice, all right? And and unfortunately, given the size of our population and the infrastructure that supports it, perhaps that was the only thing or the only way it would have happened. And I'm not for a moment justifying what happened or why it happened, but I'm just talking about the social distancing piece, just that element of it here. Sure. What worries me is people living in affluent societies and affluent colonies, they're not even blasé. I mean, they're at a point I just can't fathom. I struggle. Somebody was mentioning to me the other day, and I think it's a case in Bombay as well. It's a case from Bombay, rather, where a certain society has been quarantined, put into containment or whatever, for one or two flats who've got cases. What's happening is that the rest of the building flat members are busy having parties with each other within the building. Right. That's sheer irresponsibility. That's absolutely selfish, I would say, to another level. Isn't it? I mean, I'm seeing, I know people who will tell me that, uh, you know, we just went for a walk on Marine Drive. And my question is why? Because the lockdown has eased, but the virus has not, because we're still in a situation where there's a pandemic and how come you're not able to comprehend what's going on around you and in fact like you mentioned you know a lot of affluent homes the house help is getting the virus or contracting the virus and then there's a problem because you know you think that you've got it from them but actually you're the one who's 
putting them into that position where they're actually going out, getting your things, groceries, and then you walk around and you come back pretending like nothing's happened. And there are little picnics happening in societies. It's, you're right, it's unfathomable. <laughs> And it's also kind of selfish. It is. And that completely blows my mind. I mean, I'm sorry, this might sound a bit dramatic. But when this happened, and I said, I was talking to some senior citizens, because who they really struggled to come to terms with this, you know. And I suppose, given the way the life they have led, and, you know, in parallel with the way our country has developed, times were difficult for them. And they've seen some very difficult times. So, and they had little choice but to deal with it. So they kind of used to challenges in life and they say, oh, you know, nothing is going to happen to us, don't worry. And and I had to take a bit of a dramatic analogy. And I said, look, there's Yamdut quite literally in the air. <laughs> and I said, it is perhaps a biological warfare that's been unleashed on the world. Obviously, the jury is out on that. Having said that, you know, it's a very focused targeting just on humans. It's coming to get you in your house, whether it comes through contact when you're gone or whether if it's somebody who comes home, but it's, it's addressing just the humans. It's leaving the infrastructure out. And, and Lord forbid, Lord forbid may it never happen if there were bombs falling outside. You wouldn't have stirred out of a bomb shelter you would have created overnight in your house. Then there would have been none of this fuss about, oh, the economy is going here and, you know, I need to step out and my personal space. You know, all of that, I'm sorry it's sounding a bit of a rant, but, you know, I think people, they're not getting the gravity of it, and probably which is why it's not coming under control. I understand there's an economic reason. I completely get that, okay? I'm not for a moment saying there's a huge population who needs to go out there and make a living, okay? You and I need to go out and get our basics. After all, even we're running our businesses. We haven't stopped it. My concern is those who are not doing it responsibly. You know, this thing about talking about picnics and parties and all. Let's get real over here. Actually. We really need to get real. I know. It's a shame, actually. It's a shame because I think the word that people should focus on is being responsible citizens more than anything else. Because leave alone the social distancing and the new normal and all the, the new uh, jargons, like you said. But if you actually just focus on what is your responsibility at the moment, I think it would really change the game and, you know, we will be able to curtail things. But let's just hope that we're able to kind of be that little drop in the ocean in our own way. That's the least we can do, I'm guessing. Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, it's about the attitude and approach because once you do that, it automatically flows into other areas of what you do. And therefore, even in your business, you will conduct it in a manner that's responsible your processes will be such that it's sensitive to the requirement of the environment and people, you know, you don't take shortcuts. Right. And anything that's done on good basics, maybe a slightly slower journey, but it's a surer journey. I mean, look at us today, which are the brands we're going back to, the brands we trust, who built themselves on strong ethics, on strong fundamentals. You're not going to go and buy anything fancy today, just on the whim of it. You'll only buy what you really need. You know, having said that, Vibhuti, I was wondering what your take is on something. So I'm going to come back from the, this conversation that we've had so far about the current scenario and uh, come back to, you know, a little bit about the startups. Because apart from this unparalleled situation, which is demotivating a lot of startups in general, you know, there's only about 33% startups which make it up to a decade and about 4% are able to actually hold themselves through five years of being able to get into a functional business space. And um, my question really was that with or without the situation that we're in, why do you think sometimes startups fail and how can they actually make sure that they don't? Fair question, Zarina. And I think it's interesting you ask this in the current times, especially. Mm -hmm. I think it also goes back to a piece you, you asked a little earlier about, you know, what would you suggest in the current times, how startups or even people otherwise go. Um, I think it eventually boils down to resilience and inner strength. And uh, that's the point which I make to all of them through this period. And it was a point which I would make even earlier, but even more so now, which is that please don't make 
COVID bigger than what it is in your own head. Right. Because when you keep kind of churning it within your head, it becomes this massive monster, which is all of inside of you. I think you need to accept, yes, it's a problem. It's something we need to be mindful and cognizant of. But keeping that in mind, we need to keep chipping away. That's very critical because challenges will come to all of us. And they're not going to ask for a time and an appointment with you. They will come just exactly when you really don't want them to come. And you have to deal with it. I mean, all of us as well who are running uh, or have businesses, this challenge is applicable to everybody. It's applicable to the man on the street. It's, it's applicable to even large corporations. It's applicable to startups. And that's what I say to them. I said, look, just please take this as any other challenge which has come to you in life. How do you accept it? How do you work around it? And, you know, we've spoken about the ways you can work around it and get on with life. But it's eventually about that moment when you sit with yourself, uh, you kind of struggle, what do I do next? And you have to pull out that internal strength, that, that resilience in yourself and say, no, I will go back. And I think what happens also is when, you're, when your back is against the wall, and you know you're lying awake at night wondering how to solve that problem is when the simplest of solutions comes to you and you wonder where was it all these days right and you kind of uh, move on then it's it's all about resilience putting your head down just let it go let let it go on right now I'm, i mean you know vibhuti i just feel that of course the last few months have been a certain way for us but over a period of years startups have struggled because not many last over five years, only 4% do in general, you know, that's, that's a US consensus. But if I see the world, it's only about, about a 40, 45% as such. And that itself is something that people need to work on because the resilience has to come in irrespective, I'm guessing of our current situation, right? Yes, for sure. And I think there's, there's another piece to it. And I'm glad the percentage of that is kind of depleting or reducing rather is that a lot of people who come in, they say, oh, I'm looking for somebody to invest in my business. And uh, there were times when they did get invested on just an idea or at a very initial stage. So what's happened is that that money was never really theirs in a manner of speaking. And I'm not saying all, but a lot of them have also kind of taken that money and put it in places which is probably not the right place to do. I think in any business, what's fundamental is that you make your bottom line positive. You know, in traditional times, they were called test market. Today, you call it validation, which is the same thing. Essentially, you're going out, testing it, seeing whether you make money on it or not. Uh, you know, it can't be growth at the cost of your bottom line. And a lot of businesses made that mistake at that time. You know, you're kind of giving away freebies, you're giving away huge discounts. Look, as consumers, all of us love a great discount. Who doesn't? I love it. You love it. We all love a great discount. We would, of course, buy the product. But what does it do for the bottom line of the business? And I think that's where a lot of people made a mistake of getting growth at any cost, which in today's uh, environment is going to be even more critical. That Take a small section, get your basics right, sort out all you need to, and once you've got that going, then replicate it into other markets. Don't be in this grand hurry to uh, get that X number of uh, whatever, you know, consumers or viewership, readership, whatever it may be, because a lot of them ran after valuations. And valuations obviously is a slightly different way of doing things where you need those numbers. But that's, I think, where they also created a problem for themselves. Very well put. I'm, I, my question next to you actually was, what would your words of wisdom be to startups? But I'm guessing this kind of covers that too, unless you have something else to add there. Nothing. I mean, the only thing I might leave, which I haven't spoken about, and I don't think any business course covers, is this soft element called ethics, which I have a very strong belief in. And I think it goes back in today's time about the honesty of your product, the honesty of the service you deliver and what you charge for it right you know all of us have enough examples within our own environment in the country of organizations you would blindly trust blindly okay even after so many years and there are those where you know intrinsically that 
yeah, I mean, you know, what, what he's saying is really not the right thing, but you kind of discount it and you move on. When it comes to crunch time or even otherwise, in the long run, if there is a brand that is genuinely true and ethical, and it takes years of work, it's not something that comes overnight, and it has to run top down. It has to run top down. It's about the way you deal with your people. It's the way with the conversations you have with them, because that percolates within the organization and outside to your customers as well. And look, everybody knows when you're kind of fibbing to them and when you're not. They may choose to keep quiet for ABC reasons, but they'll politely not come back to you. And there are those who you tell them up front that, look, you know, I, I have a problem. I cannot deliver product to you until X, Y, Z date. But you know what? I will deliver it to you on day Z. As opposed to somebody who'll say, oh, no problem. You know, you've come to see me and, uh, oh, it's there tomorrow with you. You know, Come tomorrow, come day after. Um, we've heard enough of horror stories. Oh, you know, the product has left the warehouse. Hasn't it uh, made it to your uh, warehouse? No, no, there must be a traffic problem. Or, you know, the Octroiga must have held it up. You know, and all these regular stories. I mean, there are enough stories like these we know. And you know the guy hasn't even produced the product, leave alone anything else. You're never going to go back to somebody like that. And this is obviously a very small anecdote I'm taking. I think it's about the way you conduct your business and the way you do your So it always plays in the wrong run. Always. True. Because then you're true to your employees as well. And um, it's very hard to build a good team. It's very hard to get good people. You really need to work very hard. And, and that's a huge asset. And ethics is something that would really help you. Okay? That's fantastic. That's really nicely done. I mean, a very holistic answer. Thank you, Vibhuti. I don't think I'm going to let you go off so easily because uh, I think, as I said at the start of the conversation about similarities of what you and I am doing or trying mm -hmm. to achieve, um, mm -hmm. and I might want to draw upon some of that to try and understand from your experiences that you would have met lots of people, I'm sure, across the entire cross-section. Yes. In trying to empower them in the work that you do. And I would be delighted and honored to understand from you uh, what is it that you've figured across the, the, the years that we could apply to the work that we're doing with the entrepreneurs. So, Vibhuti, I think one of the things that I've learned across different aspects, different dynamics, industries, age groups, and education backgrounds of entrepreneurs, one of the things that I've learned is there is a certain level of sometimes entitlement that comes with the designation. And uh, a lot of times there are preconceived notions or I'd, I'd say, you know, you just have this, um, this stigma about how a boss is supposed to be. You know, you're supposed to be strict to get work done or you're supposed to be nice to get work done. But we categorize people too soon. We categorize leadership skills too soon. And sometimes I think maybe it would be nice to have a little fluidity. So uh, one thing that works across various aspects of any kind of entrepreneur and entrepreneurial leadership, I'd say, is uh, flexibility and fluidity to understand what's the need of the hour, to understand what's required of you in the moment. You know, if your basic style is autocratic, does not mean it's always going to work. If it's um, possibly um, servant leadership, it's not going to always work. If it's transformational also, it might not always work. So there's a fluidity that is required in a leadership position and it should come with uh, no stereotypes. It should come with good people skills. And um, there's this principle that I believe in and it's called the CAPE principle. So it stands for compassion, attitude perseverance and empathy and i think when leaders wear that cape everything seems to be slightly easier wonderful and i think very very pertinent points you make both about um, entitlement and certain typesets that we uh, we tend to operate within and uh, i don't know if i'm steering into muddy waters here but as managers or as workers or in whatever we want to call when we work across various parts of our country, each part of our country operates differently culturally. You know, I've seen that across when you're dealing with people in the different parts of the country. And I've seen in some instances where there's been a clash of work because, you know, one style obviously was, was polarizingly the other end for another part of the country. 
what would be your advice in a situation like that, especially when you're also dealing with businesses, with customers who are different across in different parts of the country? I think the advice is, you know, how you mentioned confidence earlier. I think one of the simplest piece of advice is communication and good listening skills, because the entire aspect of not understanding what your customers' needs are or internal, external customers or uh, clients outside, it simply comes down and boils down to miscommunication, not being able to understand. And if there's a clear, transparent communication with good listening skills, I think that really does the job, Vibhuti. Wonderful. I mean, I think and I think, I think that's also fair. A lot of times... Um... When the person across is not even finished speaking, we've already formulated the answer in our head and we're ready to blurt it out. Right, right. So, so yes, I think listening skills is something uh, we could all do with. Thank you for asking me those questions. So we're coming to the end of our conversation today. And um, I have reached the last segment and, of course, the most important segment as well because it's the empowering series and I can't do without asking you what empowers you, Vibhuti? Interesting. Look, I think it goes back to the point which I made somewhere in the conversation about the whole sense of humbleness and the humility which this role has brought to me. And um, I think even if I kind of reflect on it, it's about the power of dreaming. It's the power of going out there and doing it. When you meet the people, and I, I probably give you a couple of uh, anecdotes. One was many, many years ago, um, you know, I was doing the usual routine of running to work in the morning, got out of the lift and was running across the lobby of the building towards my car. And the watchman, you know, did his usual morning and I kind of just responded to him. And this was something we did every day. And I'm talking about almost 20 years ago now. So, you know, it, the country was a very different place at that point in time. And he says to me, sir, you know, I need a moment of you. And I said, yeah, sure. Uh, he says, you know, I want to get a passport made for myself. And that kind of broke my wrong notions that I had, you know, because we all tend to live in our own glass bubbles of what we think the world is. And at that time, trying to get a passport was not like how easy it is today. You know, you fill in a form and you have a you know, pre-decided appointment, you land up in the office and it goes through like clockwork. And that was the time when you stood on the pavement outside passport office at Worley, you know, at eight in the morning. And, and we all know what we went through. And trying to get a passport was as good as you having gone abroad. It was another matter whether you had gone or not. You know? So it kind of hit me and I'm saying, and I said to myself, of course, there is no limitations on what you can aspire and dream for anybody. Who are we to decide or judge who can dream or do what? And if I take the parallel of that incident which happened, and I still recall that very clearly to today, Mm -hmm. is the same for entrepreneurs. There are, especially on what we call tier two cities, there are students who come from colleges with some amazing ideas and some amazing amount of resilience in them. There was somebody in Gujarat and he was doing work with refuse ghee and oil. You know, when uh, the samosa wala on the street side right. or even McDonald's, once they've gone through a certain number of cycles of the fat or the oil, you know, cooking medium in which they make their french fries or whatever, it's supposed to be thrown away. This guy would go and pick up tins of those and in his garage, he would add a certain chemical to cleanse it and he used it as fuel for a chakra. You know, chakra are these... Uh, homemade yeah. uh, four-wheelers in the interiors. Right. And believe you me, he got a PUC clearance for it. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. <laughs> now, the challenge, obviously, in the reality of today's life is that the poor guy is against a lot of lobbies who would never want this to happen. There was another person, again, and I'm picking up basics, you know, of areas which affect us as a country. So this is, of course, pollution. There's somebody in drinking water. He was, I think, a test product. North Bengal, the drinking water which is drawn from the ground has a huge amount of arsenic content in it. And uh, therefore, it's, you know, it's not safe for the villagers to drink it. So this guy as part of his project and with a bit of support from TIS uh, in terms of grants and stuff like that, thought he'll try and build something for the village where they can get clean drinking water. And uh, he started by using the regular hand pump, which is there in every village. 
and that didn't work because some child's ball will hit it some uh, village dog will come and do it some you know some bucket will hit it it didn't work so he then scratched his head and he used you know we used to have these old filters water filters in the house which had two sections the top and the bottom with those um, i think ceramic candles inside them he used the same principle and he built this huge room which had two sections the upper and the lower um, right across it uh, end to end the top end of the water which would be drawn from the normal source he would add a certain chemical to it and um, you know the dividing floor wall so to speak when he added the chemical this would separate a bit like how it happens when you add alum to water and and the purified water would then percolate down into the lower section and then you kind of drew water from the tap you know simple mechanism no electricity nothing right now it sounds very easy but it took obviously a lot of work and effort and energy for him to do that and obviously to stay in the village to do this and uh, once it was up and running after about 2 3 days he found that nobody was visiting and he was a bit surprised because all the ladies had a massive problem they would have to go early morning walk to the well draw water in the pots bring it back and you know do that process twice a day right. and here was something which was within the village and uh, when he dug deeper he realized that a certain section of the village were not allowing the other section of the village to draw water from there because they both came from different backgrounds he was obviously dumbstruck because you know water is a basic requirement everybody needs to have irrespective of what your background is he tried you know obviously working around it because there were months of effort and energy he put into it but obviously nothing happened and you know how the the law of uh, jungle is one fine morning he found that that house had been broken down you know deal with it so what he then did is he created a, a small unit which the lady could keep within her house the same thing the same principles two sections you add that solution the you know the uh, the particles separate and it percolates to a lower section and you know off she goes and this didn't use electricity importantly he charged them for it because then the lady of the house also valued it uh, what happens is that when you don't charge people uh, they have no value for it in both these stories sreena what i find is this huge strength of if you might call empowerment that i feel that look there's just so much that's happening in our country there's so much that people are doing and and that's what really drives you every day to go to work that genuinely stretches your thinking in every direction if you were doing any traditional role you know you'd be just focused on assuming i was selling ketchup for argument say mm-hmm. um i'll probably only be worried about tomatoes and uh, bottles and whatever else but you know here i'm being pulled into pollution into sanitation into education into ai there's just so much that's happening in the country and i think that's really humbling and really empowering the stories you've shared by themselves are so enthralling and uh, they're so empowering I, i just kind of get an idea from where you have got such positivity and it's been such a fantastic conversation today vibhuti and i've really enjoyed myself it's been enlightening educating and extremely significant extremely wonderful to have this conversation with you so the stories you've shared the experiences you've shared your journey so far all over so empowering for anybody who's going to listen to this episode i'm really glad that we could have you on our show today vibhuti thank you so much it's been it's been a pleasure for me and an honor for me to speak with you zarina because um, it's just been an absolute pleasure to have a very forthright conversation this was a wonderful conversation vibhuti and uh, you know we have actually exceeded our usual time we are about 45 50 minutes into a conversation <laughs> <laughs> so which means that we had an extremely interesting conversation and i didn't want to um, interrupt or stop you anywhere because it was very interesting to have you amazing conversation thank you vibhuti i'm i'm so glad this uh, worked out thank you to you zarina because i think it's critical on the moderator to be able to draw things out and set the tone so i think the credit goes to you frankly and uh, it's not about you scratch my back and i yours uh, but uh, i'm just stating it the way it is uh, so thank you it's been wonderful it's been wonderful thank you and all the best to you and um, hope you remain as productive and efficient throughout this <laughs> entire period and um, furthermore If you liked this podcast don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network 
You can listen to us on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. I hope you enjoyed that show. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money. Some really fun guests on the network this week. Cyrus welcomed Dia Mirza to come and have a conversation about all kinds of different things. Danny Morrison was on Edges and Sledges, the cricket podcast. If you haven't heard that, that's always a fun listen. And Raul Subramani was on Football Should Ball to grow their ever more exciting list of guests. And it's not just that. Uh, Mantra Muk, the old friend of ours, was on Advertising Is Dead. Manu Palai was on the Filter Poffee podcast. It's been one great guest after the other. And with that, we hope to catch you again next week. Namaskar, this is Ashish Vidyarthi. Yes, my friend, these are challenging times. But in these challenging times, we can create something extraordinary. Do take time to listen to my podcast, Begin the Journey. Available on the IVM Podcast, website, app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Remember, we have a great opportunity called life. Cheers. Cheers.